First of all, thank you all for coming. I know the topic isn't the cheeriest, and uh, events of the recent month have not made things more cheery as we talk about Iran. And um, I also want to thank Otto Müller, I'm going to say that with an umlaut, um, for helping me because without his help, there would not be a PowerPoint presentation to accompany this lecture. And um, I want to apologize. I am still sick, so um, my voice is a little bit funny. <laughs> okay. And um, I'm going to start. I'm hoping that there'll be time for questions. And as you know from Bill's introduction of me, I am not an expert on Iran, and I will try to answer questions if you have any at the end. But I can't guarantee that my knowledge, which is so limited, will cover that area. And um, Anyway, with that, I guess I will start and um, say that when I one, you know, asked Emrys if I could do this talk um, at the Berggren back in September, I had no idea that this last month would have such a rush of events, even more than normal, about Iran, that Iran would be in the news almost every single day, and that it would seem like the Iran nuclear crisis would be reaching new heights of tension. Um, and in the last month, some of the events that you may have followed include um, what seems to have been yet another targeted assassination of an Iranian nuclear scientist. Um, there have been several since 2009. Um, this was one of the deputy directors of one of the key uranium enrichment plants in Natanz. Um, and I'm going to actually... going to be helpful. Um, so he was the deputy director in my first time using this. All right, let me see. Uh, okay. Okay. In the tense. Um, then right outside of Qom, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing these cities right, so I'm sorry about that. You'll see right there. Um, there was another nuclear um, enrichment facility. It's called the Fordo facility. And they started enriching, um, doing medium level enrichment of uranium. Um, and later in January, um, delegates from the International Atomic Energy Agency um, arrived in Tehran to examine that facility. All this has happened in the last month. Um, in addition to that, the European Union um, agreed to have a ban on importing Ura um, Iranian oil, and that will start in July. That was on, um, I think, J January 23rd, and then six days later, the Iranian government responded by saying, okay, if you want to ban our oil, we'll stop shipping it to you right away. That has not yet happened, but that will leave certain European countries that have particularly fragile economies, very vulnerable because they won't have time to look for, or as much time to look for alternative sources of oil. Um, so that's another thing that's happened in the last month. Let me just see. And politically, I don't know if you followed it just in the last, say, since early 2011, there's been more of a rift between the religious leaders of Iran and President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And um, in some, it's been over a power struggle. He wanted to claim more powers for the office of the president. Um, he has also seriously mismanaged the economy of Iran, which is a more complicated story. And he's not the only person who's mismanaged that economy. Um, but there was a power struggle there, a sort of falling out. He was less the favorite son than he had been in his first term. Um, he has now, um, for the first time, this is the first time it's happened to a president in Iran, and that office was only created in 1979 with a revolution. Um, it's the first time a president has been summoned to the parliament, I guess against his will, he hasn't gone there yet, um, to talk about his management of the Iranian economy. Okay, um, so when I signed up to talk about stuff, things weren't so hot and tense, whatever like that. Um, and actually, 
one of my colleagues, Vicki Eckler, reminded me of something else that's happened in the last week, which I don't want you to leave out, that um, Simpson, dolls from the Simpson comedy, have been uh, banned in Iran now. Um, and that was just a follow-up on the ban on Barbie doll dolls, because they are a corrupt influence of Western society. Um, the Barbie, because she was too voluptuous, I guess, revealed too much, had too much of an adult figure. And the Simpsons, they said, well, it couldn't be for that reason, but no one is exactly sure why, but just for that. Okay. Um, I also want to say, you know, Hess again, I'm not an expert. My sources that I use for this talk are open sources that are available to all of you. I used um, some information available through certain Washington think tanks, um, so the Brookings Institution, um, I don't see everyone I used, uh, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And there was one particular correspondent, Ali Alfona, that I really like. He's at the American Enterprise Institute, which is very conservative, and I have some problems with that organization. But um, he is one particularly excellent um, correspondent, so I use that as an important source. Um, also, there's what's called the Dubai Initiative, which is a collaboration between the Harvard Kennedy School and the Dubai School of Government, which comes out with some excellent reports, um, whether or not you agree with all their perspectives. And I use some traditional sources, some German news sources, the BBC, the New York Times, the Washington Post. And those sources, for the sources that they used, um, they used open sources in other languages, for example, in Farsi and Arabic, that. I had no direct access to because I don't speak those languages or know those languages. And um, they also have people who are reporters um, working closely with sources in Iran and Iranian sources in exile. Okay. So, um, okay. um, talking about Iran, I think to understand it some, and no short Bergen Forum is going to sum up the history, the complex history of that area for us. <laughs> um, but it does help a tiny bit to just see where it's located and to see what a crazy neighborhood it's in. Um, so if you look around, Iran's neighbors are not mild-mannered, kind of peaceful, loving people, whatever like that. So you can see. Starting here, you can see that um, Iran is separated from Kuwait by just a small strip of Iraq. One of its neighbors is Iraq. Um, and moving further to the north, you see neighbors such as Turkey, um, Azerbaijan, Armenia. They aren't the rough kids in the neighborhood. And you can also see Turkmenistan over in the east and um, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And then just last week, we had a great Bergen Forum about the adventures of Professors Laurel and John Buckwalter in Astrakhan in Russia, a city located at the delta of the Volga, going into the Caspian Sea, um, right there. Okay, And now we're going to the southern end of the Caspian, um, where Iran is located. And just to note that Russia and Iran are important trading partners for each other. Okay, so, um, and there. If you didn't know, it's Tehran, just to locate that. Okay. So that tells you a little bit about Iran. And another important um, bit of information, just as background information, is that for a number of reasons throughout the region, many countries in the, in the, in the region are experiencing what's called a youth bulge um, in some of the reports, and that means of disproportionately large population between the ages of 15 and 29. That's how they're defining youth. Um, so a lot of us already knew we weren't young, but anyway, <laughs> there you go. Okay. And Iran and let me just show you over here. Okay. So Qatar is how I'm saying it. I know I'm not pronouncing it right, but right there. Those are the two countries in the area, and in fact, in the world, that have the largest youth bulge. Um, their population between 15 and 29 um, is 34 percent. 
And to give you some comparison of that, in Egypt right now it's 29%. And in the United States, the figures I have are not for that exact population. I got them from the 2010 census. And we don't break up the population in a group that's 15 to 29, but the closest group I had was 18 to 24. And um, that makes up 9.9% .9 of the U.S. population. So if that helps put that in perspective at all. And in Iran, this is to impart to policies, um, fertility policies, right after the Iranian Revolution in 1979. So there's sort of a baby boom that happened um, between 79 and 1984, which was counterbalanced a little bit by all the people that got lost in the Iran-Iraq War. But nevertheless, the populations are different populations. Um, and as this population is coming, um, has, is graduating from schools and wants to enter the job market, it's creating a problem. There are, in Iran, there are six people in that age cohort, the cohort um, between 15 and 29, um, entering the job market for every one person in the retirement cohort, so leaving the job market. So this is a problem throughout the area, and some people attribute the Arab, Arab Spring in part to this phenomenon, to a lot of young people who are facing very difficult employment prospects. In Iran, um, it is the same story. And um, the projections for much of the area, there's some exceptions like Iraq, that this youth bulge will pass, that that particular cohort will become smaller percentage-wise. In absolute numbers, the number of people in that age group will continue to rise. Okay. Um, then, So this is one chart that I got from a study done by the Dubai Initiative. And the figures are pretty shocking um, in any account. And what I want to say is there are different populations that they studied. Um, who, which population is hit the hardest by the unemployment right now? And um, it hits different populations, obviously, differently. So if we're just still talking about a group of people basically between 20 and 29, those who have finished their schooling and are trying to enter the job market. <clears throat> in one way, it hits the better educated and wealthier population harder because they're pickier, okay? So when they look at these statistics, that population is more likely to wait longer to get a job that pays better or that will really advance their career. And that will mean that population will also tend to delay getting married, okay? Um, and there's a name studies have given this whole period. It's called weighthood instead of adulthood um, to refer to this period. And that population, the wealthier, better educated population, is also more likely to stay longer in their parents' home. Okay. Um, this doesn't mean that the less educated, poorer population is not affected by these by this unemployment as seriously. It's just that they don't have the option of waiting for a better paying job. And they may need to, you know, move out of their parents' home. They may take, you know, they may just not have any or the same options as this population has. But if you'll notice from this chart, um, the population that is least affected by the unemployment right now is the less educated, the least educated female population, which seems to show that in relative terms, unskilled low pay jobs for women are still available at a higher rate than those for a better educated population. Um, the figure that really is telling, especially about Iranian culture, is this one and this one here. Okay. This is for the best educated um, part of this cohort. So male right there and then female. And you will see the shocking difference between the unemployment among the best educated women and the best educated men. And that is due in part to Iranian culture, which, which still values women staying in the home, being homemakers, having children, more than being out in the workforce, even though there is an ever-growing population of single, highly educated Iranian women who would like to enter the workforce. Um, there is a certain segment of jobs that are seen as appropriate for women in this 
cohort and with this level of education, and that would include some typical sort of jobs that are seen as appropriate for women, even in this country, um, nursing, teaching, and then there's some public sector jobs. But as the government has faced um, some economic problems in recent years, especially since 2008, some of those public sector jobs have also been more limited or cut, and that means there's just fewer options for educated women in gender appropriate jobs than there are for the educated men. Okay. Um, so with this kind of background, I just want to turn to 2009, and that is the year that the Iranian government, which has been very careful about what um, media services it allows into the country and how much control it has over them, um, allowed multimedia messaging to come into the country. And it was also the year that the Iranian government did a particularly bad job of covering up a rigged election. It didn't even seem like it was really trying this time. Um, so the election was held on June 12th, 2009. This is presidential elections. The incumbent, Ahmadinejad, was up for re-election. He was one of the four candidates that were approved um, to run, into the, run in the election. And... Um, the Guardian Council is the council that approves the candidates, and there were 476 potential presidential candidates, and they approved four of them. And the three others, two of them are in their 70s and participated in the 1979 um, revolution and have often also served in the government. I would say they are moderates. They are not radicals by any means. The radicals did not get selected by the Guardian Council to run as candidates. Um, so maybe their last names are most important if you want to hold them in your head. Musavi and Kahubi, and please forgive me, anyone who does speak Farsi, if I'm mispronouncing these names. And the third of the candidates that was approved is in his 50s, and he is just a completely different type of candidate than the first two. Um, he is, um, I'm just going to get his name, Rezai, Rezai, um, Musan Rezai, um, and he um, was the core chief commander of the Revolutionary Guard for 16 years and extremely conservative. So, again, a very different type of candidate, and that will play a role as the um, demonstrations after the elections get started. Um, so of all these candidates, Musavi is actually the one that had the most popular support. But the um, Ayatollah, the supreme leader, um, Ali Khamenei, made it clear that he supported the re-election of Ahmadinejad. And um, here I'm going to read a little bit. Um, the final results show that there had been 85% voter turnout. Ahmadinejad had received approximately 63 percent of the vote, and even in the hometown of his three challengers, he supposedly received over 90 percent of the vote, um, and there were claims that there were no voting forms available in areas that have supported the challengers or would have supported the challengers, and representatives of the challengers were not permitted at many of the voting stations. Um, so, and at this point, only Musavi and Karubi are going to play Again, an important part in what happens afterwards. Rezai is conservative and is not involved in what's going to happen. Okay. What happens almost immediately is that millions of people hit the streets, and these are people of all educational levels, all economic classes, all age groups, in protest of the rigged elections. Iranians have been putting up with an awful lot with this clear violation of the Constitution and other democratic rights actually did, you know, generate a lot of protest. Um, another thing that you might notice um, about protests in Iran is that you really do risk your life to participate in them. This isn't the first round of protests. There have been demonstrations regularly. Even before the Iranian Revolution, there were protests, <laughs> which eventually even led to the revolution. Um, but in each of these demonstrations, you clearly are risking your life. Um, so that's another thing to think about as people hit the streets. Um, this is sort of the, the birth of the green movement. A lot of the protesters were green, and green was the um, co 
color of Musavi's campaign. Um, and so what you see right here in this picture is millions of people on Freedom Square in downtown Tehran. This is just backing up a little bit from that initial picture. Okay. Um, what happened, um, there were protests, not just in Tehran, but throughout much of Iran, and there were also protests in support um, throughout the world almost immediately. And these protests are actually going to continue for months, for months. Um, and the Revolutionary Guard, and then there's a paramilitary force called, and again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, it's B-A-S-I-J, the Basish, um, Basish. Um, and they're about 90,000 strong, um, and they're sort of headed by the Revolutionary Guard um, that actually um, violently attacked a lot of the demonstrators. So people were killed on the streets, people were arrested and killed later, um, people were arrested and imprisoned and tortured and released. Um, a lot of different things happened to demonstrators. Some demonstrators were not arrested, but that's sort of the whole spectrum there. Um, and what happened was, as each round of demonstrations happened and people got killed, then there were protests and um, memorial gatherings, some mourning ceremonies for that round of people that had gotten killed, and then more protests and more gatherings to mourn those who had been killed. And um, a lot of them were, a lot of the mourning gatherings and the burials were held at this central cemetery of, um, it's right outside of Tehran, called um, Sarah's Paradise, Sarah's Paradise, um, the Heshtat Zara. And um, it is an extremely large cemetery. And when Otto set up this slide for me, he did something for a scale. Um, right there is a normal running track, I guess you would say. Right there. And this. That's the cemetery. So you can see how large it is. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the most well-known cases of a demonstrator being killed was a woman named Neda, who was actually not politically active, but who had gone with her voice teacher. And she was taking underground voice lessons because you're not allowed to have voice lessons um, to sing, I guess, certain types of music in Iran at the moment. Um, they just were going to see one of the demonstrations. It was very hot. I think the air conditioning in her car wasn't working, so they got out to walk towards the demonstration, and almost immediately she was shot. And the reason this sort of got to be well known was that people with cell phones that were nearby um, took video footage of her dying and um, people trying to save her, but then her dying. And then it got put on YouTube, and it was sort of watched all around the world. This is a picture from that video of people trying to resuscitate her. But then the next video, the next shot has all the blood gushing out of her. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to go on. I don't want you having to look at that picture for an extended period of time. So, okay. Anyway. Um, later in June, the Garden Council. Um, affirmed that the election results were okay. Um, there were more protests. There were also protests outside the Russian embassy when the Russian government came out in support of the election results. Um, in August, there were trials against many of the people that had been arrested in June and July. Um, on August 5th, Ahmadinejad was sworn in for his second term. Um, there were more demonstrations and it slowly came out, but this is going to come out actually a lot later, that a lot of the people that had been killed in prison were being secretly buried in Sarah's Paradise in this graveyard in unmarked graves in a certain plot of the graveyard. Um, so even though records are kept of everyone, and they were kept of these people, it was in a sort of 
secret part of the graveyard that not everyone had access to or was guarded, unlike the rest of the graveyard. Okay. Um, there was like one year after the election, so this would be in June um, 2010, there were planned demonstrations to sort of protest the anniversary of the rigged elections, but Musavi and Karubi, who had actually gone through a lot of suffering in that <laughs> intervening year, they had been um, targeted by a lot of government forces and agencies and had been um, kept sort of in isolation from their supporters during that year. They encouraged their supporters not to go to any kind of demonstration because they were afraid of sort of the violent reception that their supporters might meet if they did something like that. Um, and they, again, both they physically and their property had been attacked numerous times during that year. And then in February 2011, so this is skipping a lot, um, during the Arab Spring, during the uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia, um, Musavi and Karubi um, came out in support of what was going on in those countries. Um, and so immediately they and other leaders in the Green, green Movement are put under house arrest. And I cannot be sure, um, I really was not able to find out really up-to-date information about this, but as far as I know, they are still under house arrest, even though they have been allowed to visit people in their family and they have been allowed to receive visitors. But I think that they are still under house arrest. Okay, and um, so um, what's on the screen right now <laughs> is one of the reasons I wanted to give this talk. Um, in September of 2011, this book was published in Sarah's Paradise, and it had been being published in a serialized form for almost two years, and um, it's an account uh, of what happened in June and July of 2009, and it is published by two men, and um, can, ooh, sorry, Amir is an Iranian American, who's the writer, and Khalil is the artist who drew this. This is a graphic novel, and um, when this came out, I had heard about it through the German news um, and had seen segments of it before. And then again, the whole graphic novel was finally published in one volume in September of 2011. And I was just so inspired by what the, um, these two men had done that I had asked Emrys if I could give this talk. And um, these two men, Amir and Khalil, have remained anonymous. Um, and in part because they are afraid for their lives and they have reason to be. And one of the things I found so inspiring about their work is that they took full advantage of technology, okay? So they were able to um, work on this in a way that allowed them to protect themselves and their sources, which is an extremely important thing to do um, because it is so easy to be targeted and arrested, okay, in Iran. and so whether or not they were in Iran, they made full use of technology again, which was an important thing. And they also, um, they were able to post episodes sometimes as much as, many times as three times a week. And the form of technology that they chose allowed them to be in touch with their readers, to have feedback. Um, and they also were able to use technology, Google, for example, to track who was reading their work. Um, and they could tell that they were being read in 20 different cities in Iran. They also got responses from people inside of Iran, which allowed them to know that people were actually reading what they were writing. And they also could tell that their work was being read in over 80 countries throughout the world. And their work was published in 12 different languages, including English, but also so Farsi and Arabic. Um, so that was great, and I guess, what was so important is that they were allowing people throughout the world to find out what was going on in Iran. So, I want to go to another graphic novel that was first published in 2000. Um, one of the things about the graphic novels is that sometimes it reaches a different or a wider audience than some traditional sources, such as traditional novels or newspapers. And um, 
one graphic novel that did this for Iran, but for an earlier period, the period of the Iranian Revolution and the Iran-Iraq War was Persepolis, um, which has been published again in numerous languages and over a course of years starting in around 2000. And um, when this came out, it introduced a, a, you know, a wider audience to what was going on in Iran at an important time um, in the United States, it sort of came out when everyone was just associating around with Muslim terrorists or Ahmadinejad, a sort of crazy president who was coming out with a different horrible statement every other day like that, or sort of bearded mullahs. And it really made the general population of Iran more human for most people in the West, which was an important thing. One different thing between this graphic novel and Sarah's Paradise is that it came out after the events of the revolution and the Iran-Iraq war had already unfolded. So Sarah's Paradise is coming out to engage people actively in what is unfolding in Iran and to have people understand what's going on. So it's making sort of an immediate political statement in the way that Persepolis didn't. Um, but one thing, I kind of want to continue with this about um, Persepolis and Sarah's Paradise and other graphic novels. Um, is that it sort of draws you in. And Persepolis draws you in because there's this really irrepressible, wonderful little girl who's telling you about her childhood. But then, as you come in for her childhood, you stay and find out about people being tortured, about people being arrested, about bombings, about her losing one of her close childhood friends when her house is bombed during the Iran-Iraq war and all she can find when she goes back to the house is the hand of her best friend with a bracelet on, you know? And so you've come for this childhood story and you stay to find out about a lot. So this is one of the graphics from Persepolis. And my question is kind of, or my questions are, you know, do cartoons make certain horrors more palatable? You know, things that you never would want to read about. Um, in some ways, do they get to you in a way that maybe you're kind of numbed by seeing sort of similar things in the news, sort of graphic horrors in the news, but this kind of gets to you because you've already been drawn in by a narrator. I wondered about that. Um, again, I do think it reaches a different audience than the traditional newscast or the newspaper. Um, and in her novel, more than in Sarah's Paradise, I wondered if this sort of contrast between the words and the images kind of appeals to us in the way a complex film might, where there's sort of some kind of contrast between what's being said and what you're seeing. Um, and I also wondered if the visual attracts you kind of when you're rubbernecking at the scene of an accident. You can't take your eyes away from it. Certainly an earlier graphic novel, Mouse, which is about the Holocaust by Art Spiegelman. This is the cover of the second volume of Mouse. Um, did the same, you know, when I first heard about Mouse, when it came out, I was like, what? A graphic novel about the Holocaust? Okay. Um, so um, I'm just wondering if this form is particularly well suited to present really horrible things to a wider audience. Okay. This is a scene out of Sarah's Paradise. And the scene um, has a mother and her son looking for um, another one of her sons who's disappeared in June of 2009. That's the story of Sarah's Paradise, the narrative line. And they look for this missing son or missing brother in the morgue, in the hospital, they try to get into the prison to see if he's there. And so it follows them. And then they, in this whole story, they encounter people who have survived being tortured in the prison. And this is the account of one of the young men that the brother of the missing man um, has, where that man is telling him what happened to him in the prison. And you can see it's a prison um, rape scene where he's being raped by the um, guards 
And um, there has been much supporting evidence that men and women in the prisons were raped and um, tortured. So. <coughs> this is another scene from the graphic novel, Sarah's Paradise, showing two men who were arrested. And again, this is really based upon actual events, even though it is a graphic novel. Two men who are being hung publicly on a crane. That was a sort of the new instrument for hanging people, the crane, um, the construction crane, obviously. Um, they were hung for being homosexuals. So the novel is also pointing to the sort of irony of the rape scenes in the prison and then the homosexuals being hung. Um, the front cover of the novel um, hold, shows the hand of a woman holding up a cell phone and taking a picture of the demonstrators gathered in Tehran's Freedom Square. Um, and the back cover of the novel shows the streets of Tehran on June 15, 2009, when three million people gathered to protest the election results. And the protesters are holding up signs written in Farsi and English with slogans like, where is my vote? Ahmadinejad liar, democracy, and human rights. And the cartoon captions on this back cover read, a torrent that could have swept everything in its wake. And a few days later, we're dismissed as dust and dirt. Okay. And besides conveying the messages of real protesters, um, I think that the front cover also honors the role of the cell phone in the demonstrations. Um, so people were using their cell phones, they were using social media um, to organize the demonstrations. And then after foreign journalists were beaten up and a lot of their material was confiscated, Iranians could use these types of media to continue to organize and to continue to have images of what was going on be broadcast to the rest of the world. And you're seeing this right now in Syria every day. Okay. Um, but all technology can be turned against the user and has its limitations. So cell phones can leave a trail of incriminating evidence. Those who were arrested, if they were not able to delete what was on their cell phones in time, that information could be used to against them and against their contacts. Um, and then cell phone and social media can also, of course, be monitored and controlled by the government. Um, just days after the protests began, the government tightened control over all technology. Text messaging was temporarily shut down. The cell phone network was partially shut down. Websites critical of the government were blocked. Um, leaders of the opposition were actually isolated so that they couldn't use some of this. The social media or their cell phones directly or their websites were blocked um, to remain in contact with their supporters. So after hearing all of that, you might be surprised if you have friends in Iran that you can actually still contact them relatively easily. Iranians today have access to their cell phones, to foreign cable networks, to the internet. Um, they can contact people and you'll hear this when you hear how people are communicating with foreign news services, are communicating with foreign news services through Skype or services like Uvu. Um, so you're going, Wow, if they're really trying to crack down, how come, you know, maybe this government isn't so repressive after all. And um, I think what I want to say in answer to that is that um, the answer is partially the reason why the Green Movement didn't become the Green Revolution, um, that the government was willing to use extreme violence against its own citizens and there were no outside forces that were willing or able to um, moderate that, put enough pressure on the government to stop killing its own citizens or torturing them, and that even in the country, within Iran itself, even the most conservative <laughs> forces, like the sort of the clerical establishment that was critical of the violation of human rights and the torturing, 
those websites or those people, or those websites were um, closed down or blocked and those people were silenced. So um, anyway, all I'm saying is with all human rights groups banned, with the opposition in prison, dead or under house arrest, um, in exile or otherwise silenced, and with a population terrorized and subdued, the government could afford to relax its grip a little bit but it isn't like censorship and tight control of the public media have ended at all. Um, journalists and reporters and bloggers are constant targets of the government. And just this past month, a contributor to a pro-Sufi um, website was arrested in Tehran for anti-government propaganda. I'm just giving you some of the latest stuff. And the head of a social networking um, site for Young Iranian professionals um, was arrested this past month and his family does not know why he's being held or where he is. And since the demonstrations, the rates of executions for people who have supposedly insulted Islam or agitated against the government have in oh, has increased. And I would say that Amir and Khalil, the creators of Sarah's Paradise, are remaining anonymous for really good reasons. And then just so that you can hear about the student and faculty population that played a key role in the demonstrations. Um, one way that they are being targeted is that faculty members, some of them resigned in protest of the election results, but some of them who were trying not to resign, um, but who were very critical of the government and then later critical of Ahmadinejad were forced to resign. And I just wanna emphasize, these people who are being forced to resign are not radicals. Most of them support the government and the Constitution in general and could be very conservative, but the level of assault on human rights and the population is so high that even these people are speaking up and, again, are losing their job. And um, there are reports that students who have been involved in any level of civil protest are being expelled and then the government is eliminating their academic record so that there is no longer any record that they have attended the university at all, which makes it difficult for them to study anywhere else. Um, so, yes, um, I wanna say, getting towards the end of this, a former political advisor for Karubi who was one of the opposition candidates in the 2009 election. Um, he argued, he's in exile right now, and he was speaking at a seminar in the Brookings Institution. He argued that if the issue of human rights is solved in Iran, then the issue of the nuclear program will also be solved. If the Iranian people are able to choose their true representatives, they are not a people who would be pursuing nuclear weapons, unfortunately. However true that might be, the world is now focused on the Iranian nuclear crisis. And I would say with no regard for its own constitution, the Iranian government has chosen a dark destiny for its own people and perhaps for the rest of the world, depending on what happens with its nuclear program. And if you are interested in finding out more about efforts to end human rights violations in Iran, you could go to the website that I have on the screen and I want to end by expressing my gratitude to someone who has been a steadfast supporter of the Bergen Forums and who epitomizes to me an undying love of learning. I would like to give a copy of Sarah's Paradise to Matt Mueller. or any questions, but if you have any, I could try. And if someone in the audience can answer those that I can't, that would be great. 